Good morning. Good to see you all here today. This day, as we set aside uh, a special day to honor our fathers, uh, for those of us who um, have lost our fathers, it's a day of remembrance. And for those of you who are fathers, it is a special day for all of you. Um, and I pray that you will have a blessed day with your family. As far as announcements, um, if you'll turn to your insert, you'll see that uh, immediately following church today, we will meet as a board of deacons uh, briefly. Wednesday, uh, Faith and Fellowship at 6.30. Friday is our Lunch Bunch Bible Study at 11.30. Uh, of course, Saturday is Margie's Memorial Service. Um, if you plan on attending and you haven't let Roger know yet, please do so today. Um, and next Sunday, of course, worship at 11. And then there is a mistake. Monday, June 28th is not Faith and Fellowship, but it is a session meeting. Uh, at 7 p.m. So, yes. Did you have that in your notes? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you'd, if you'd rather not meet today, that's fine if you all have things to do. The 27th, okay. Next Sunday, all right. Then we will move that meeting. We will not meet after. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. <laughs> so the 27th, deacons. Okay, thank you. Um, also, um, you may note that there is now a projector um, and the screen has, has also been installed. It is functioning. Um, I guess we really can't show anything right now. Yeah, but it, it, it's really, it, it's very good. And you'll note the speakers. Um, when he finished installing everything last week, he called me into the sanctuary and, and said, go and stand wherever you want and tell me what you think. And he put in a video of a, just a movie and the sound was amazing. It's just, it's so good. Um, so we're excited to, to start playing with it and figuring out all the things that we can do with it. But, um, Thank goodness that um, that we got that done. It was it was more of a job, I think, than they anticipated. So, being that it's a slightly old building, <laughs> slightly old. <laughs> yes, thanks to Bill McMaster's it's, uh, part of his estate, and we will forever be grateful for all that he has done for this church over the years. So, and if there's no other announcement from anyone, I'll invite Harry up to call us to worship. Good morning, and happy Father's Day, and uh, happy Uncle Roger and Ryan, who have really helped participate in raising my kids for many years. So, let us be called to worship with our unison call, which is printed in the bulletin. Good morning. Good morning. Though we may be inclined to brag, let us come together with humility 
Though we may be tempted to use harsh words, let us come together with gentleness. Though we may want everything to happen quickly, let us come together with patience. Though the world around often encourages hate, let us come together in love. How good a thing it is when all of God's people live together in unity. Let us be gentleness, patience, love, and unity. Let us worship the God who has called us together. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you enable the psalmist to turn to you, confident that all his cries and prayers will be heard by you and answered by you. Prayers uttered in the belief that you would not permit evil and despair to have the last word. We offer our prayers in that same belief, and with even greater confidence, for in Jesus you have made known your great love for all people. He bears our burdens in times of trouble, and through his sacrificial love, our lives are blessed, strengthened, and empowered by the gift of the Holy Spirit. For these great gifts, we offer our thanksgiving, our praise, our adoration, and this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand if you're able and join in singing number 90 in the hymnal, Joyful, Joyful.
proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. Let us admit our sins before God if we pray our unison prayer of confession. God, God of, of love and power, and power. we, we listen, listen to the stories of miracles and doubt that these things can happen today. We look at the waves of misfortune, distress, misery, distrust, and anger, and wonder how we can still those waves. We feel the pressures of power and fear flooding into our lives, threatening to drown us, and wonder where you are. Forgive us for the littleness of our faith, Forgive us for our doubts. Help us to place our trust in you, Lord Jesus. Help us to fix our eyes on you and on the ministries to which you have called us. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As the Apostle Paul wrote, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The good news, therefore, is this. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Thanks be to our God, our sins are forgiven. You may be seated. I'd like to invite Jonathan and Macy, if you want to come up this morning and spend a little bit of time with us. Huh? Or Jeremy. <laughs> Too many J's. Come on up. Have a seat on the steps and I'll be right there. into doing something so that he will talk against you, God. So he goes down, and all of a sudden, Job loses everything he has. Everything he has. His family, his farm, the money, everything was gone. Now, he could have been really upset with God, right? He could have said, you know, God took all of this away from me, so therefore I mad at God. But he didn't. He still thanked God for being God. Then his friends got involved, and they said, you know what, Joe? Maybe you did something bad, and that's why God's punishing you. And so he sat and thought about it a long time. But then God actually came and talked to Job 
And he said to Job, who do you think you are? Who, who do you think you are? Were you there when I created the earth? Were you there when I made the mountains, when I created the oceans? Were you there? Did you witness any of that? And Job couldn't answer because he wasn't there. He wasn't there at the beginning. So there are a lot of things that happen in life that we just can't understand. And sometimes some bad things happen, right? Maybe. But that doesn't mean that God isn't still watching any of us and that he took care of us. Right? So we just always have to remember that God is with us no matter what. And all of the things that we don't understand, it's okay. Because God knows. God knows, and He is the only one sometimes who knows what to decide. So we just have to go with that, right? It's not a bad thing. It's always good. That's to know. But things happen because God wants them to happen. And He does them. So let's pray and thank God for all of you being here. Dear God, we thank you that you are always with us. You watch over us. There are things that happen that we don't understand, and we will never understand, and that's okay. Because you know how things happen. And that's the only thing that we have to do. Because you are our Father, and you take good care of us. And we love you for that. Did you do something special for the lady finish? Breakfast today?
I love that. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. There are many needs in this world, and some of those um, become known to us during the week. Um, others we've known about for some time. And there are always needs that come to our attention that we don't know the people whose names are in our bulletin, but God knows. And so this morning, as we turn to the Lord in prayer, um, we know that there are are others that may not be on that list today, but we will always keep them in our hearts and in our prayers. So let us then turn to the Lord this morning. Gracious and heavenly Father, on this day, which we have set aside to honor fathers, we give our thanks to you, Creator God, for the fathers in all of our lives. We know that fatherhood doesn't come with an instruction manual, and some fathers excel while others often fail. But we ask that you pour out your blessing on all of them. For our fathers who have passed, we thank you for their time with us, for the sacrifices they made for all of us. For the fathers of our young children, we ask that you grant wisdom, strength, and humility as they face the awesome task of parenting. We also ask today that you hear our prayers on behalf of our families, our friends, and our neighbors who have a special place in our lives Help us, all of us, to be your hands and your feet in times of need, to reach out to those who are hurting, both physically and spiritually. Where there is suffering, guide us to be messengers of hope and justice. Today, we lift especially before you, Roger and Mert, Harry and Ryan, Artur and Barbara, Margie and Bob, Steve and Kathy, Jen, young Levi, Mrs. Venable, Frank and Joyce, Christine, Jeffrey, Krissa, Eleanor, Chuck and Patty, Debbie, Bonnie, Harper and her mother Alyssa, Mary Ann, Shirley, and Jess. And Lord, we pray for this church, for all those who call upon your name as their Lord and Savior, and we thank you for the blessings which you have poured out on this congregation. Help us to be renewed in our faith as we walk daily with you by our side. We offer all of these prayers humbly in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As our offerings have been brought this day or during the week, we now turn and dedicate those offerings unto you as we pray. God, whose giving knows no ending, we offer up the treasure that you have entrusted to us. We offer up the skills and the time that you have graciously given to us, and we offer up ourselves in service and praise. Receive these gifts by your grace. Multiply and use them through the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish Christ's work of love in the world this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
please stand and join in singing the doxology. may be seated. Our first scripture reading today comes to us again from the Psalms, Psalm 9, and I'll be reading verses 9 through 20. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name will trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord enthroned in Zion. Proclaim among the nations what he has done. For he who avenges blood remembers he does not ignore the cry of the afflicted. O oh Lord, See how my enemies persecute me. Have mercy and lift me up from the great gates of death, that I may declare your praises in the gates of the daughter of Zion, and then rejoice in your salvation. The nations have fallen into the pit they have dug. Their feet are caught in the net they have hidden. The Lord is known by his justice. The wicked are ensnared by the work of their hands." The wicked return to the grave, all the nations that forget God, but the needy will not always be forgotten, nor the hope of the afflicted ever perish. Arise, O Lord, let not man triumph. Let the nations be judged in your presence. Strike them with terror, O Lord. Let the nations know they are but men." This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The sermon scripture today, as I was telling the children, is kind of a familiar one from Job. But I would like to read it today um, as it's printed in your bulletin on the back of the yellow insert, if you'd like to follow along. This is chapter 38, verses 1 through 11, as it's recorded in the translation, the message. And now, finally, God answered Job from the eye of a violent storm. He said, why do you confuse the issue? Why do you talk without knowing what you're talking about? Pull yourself together, Job. Up on your feet, stand tall. I have some questions for you and I want some straight answers. Where were you when I created the earth? Tell me, since you know so much. Who decided on its size? Certainly you'll know that. Who came up with the blueprints and the measurements? How was its foundation poured? Who set the cornerstone? While the morning stars sang in chorus and all the angels shouted praise, and who took charge of the ocean when it gushed forth like a baby from the womb? That was me. I wrapped it in soft clouds and tucked it in safely at night. Then I made a playpen for it, a strong playpen, so it couldn't run loose and said, stay here. This is your place. Your wild tantrums are confined to this place. Please pray with me. Prepare our hearts, O God, to accept your word this day. Silence in us any voice but yours, that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. 
So it's that age old question. Why do bad things happen to good people? We've all asked that, I'm sure, from time to time. We struggle, don't we, to understand the suffering of other people, good people, people who fear God, people who stay away from doing evil. That's exactly the description of the main character in today's message, Job. He's described in the opening verse of chapter 1. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job, and this man was blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. He was a good man. Now, our scripture today picks up in chapter 38, which is kind of an odd place to start. And it seems that this is exactly, precisely the time where after all of Job's problems, God finally decides to speak to him. A lot has happened to get to this place. So if we just do a quick kind of recap we know that Job has everything. He has it all. He has an extended family, vast flocks. He's constantly mindful to live in a righteous manner. God even brags about him to Satan. He, he says he's a great man. He's, he's virtuous. But Satan contends that Job is only righteous because God has favored him generously. He has given him so much. And of course, Satan challenges God. He says, let me go down and inflict some suffering on Job. He's sure that Job is going to change his standing and he's going to curse God for his misfortune. And God actually permits this experiment with one exception. He says to Satan, you can do what you will, but you will not take Job's life. So Satan is unleashed to go and do his deeds. Job receives reports that his sheep, his servants, his 10 children, they've all died. Died to different circumstances, thieving intruders, natural disasters, whatever, but he has lost all of them. So in response to his grief and his mourning, Job rips off his clothes, he shaves his head in sorrow, but he's still still praised God in his prayers. Satan doesn't believe it. So he inquires again of God and says, you know what, God, just give me one more chance. Give me another shot at breaking this man. Let me try. And God allows him another opportunity to go and test Job. And this time, Job's body becomes covered with terrible sores all over. And at this point, even his wife urges him to denounce God. Just give up and die, she says. And Job responds to his wife saying, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Job did not sin in what he said. Several friends heard about this hardship and they came to sympathize and comfort Job. They sat on the ground with him in silence for seven days and seven nights, seeing the depth of his suffering. Finally, Job begins to speak, which opens a discussion with his companions. 
the first words out of his mouth cursed the very day on which he was born. His very existence, which had been a joy when he was on the receiving end of God's favor, has now seemed to become quite a burden. Oh, how easy it would have been for him to curse God, but he doesn't. And as the conversation continues, each of his friends seems to offer their own conclusion as to Job's suffering. Well, his pain must be due to some kind of sin that he has committed. He must have performed some kind of evil to provoke God's justice. One of the men even suggests that whatever wrongdoing Job has done, he likely deserves actually more suffering than what he's experienced. So much for sympathetic friends. And so their conversation goes with Job at a loss to understand why he has been given so much to suffer. So throughout the back and forth with his friends, he seeks nothing more than an explanation. He wants to have a direct conversation with God, or at least to have a witness in heaven who can testify to his integrity. The suffering becomes unbearable. Job becomes bitter. He becomes anxious. He becomes scared. He deplores the injustice of God. That injustice that lets evil people thrive while he and so many honest people suffer. He just wants a chance to face God, to protest, but he cannot physically find God. He assumes then that his wisdom is concealed, that God's wisdom is hidden from humans. But he still decides to persevere in seeking that wisdom by fearing God, keeping away from evil. This is who he was. This is Job. He can't see beyond his narrow world view. His only perception of the situation that he's in right now is one of injustice. He begins to look at the world in legal terms, what is right and what is wrong. Caught up in the chaos of the world. He's desperate for justice to prevail. And so he, he actually asks for a legal hearing, a chance to go and plead his case. He cries out in chapter 31, let the Almighty answer me. Does Job's situation sound at all familiar to you? Are you now or have you ever faced chaos? Are the doubts and fears of life causing you to seek a chance to plead your case? You may cry out, why is this happening to me, God? Why are you letting this suffering take charge of my life? What have I done to cause your wrath? Well, Job finally gets an answer. God finally answers him. Or does he? Well, here in chapter 38, we hear God speaking out of the whirlwind. He's directing his response directly to Job, who was expecting to get an opportunity to address God directly. He wanted to know the specific charges against him, have a chance to plead his case so that he might win justice. But what happens next is totally unexpected. God begins a seemingly never-ending series of questions which Job cannot answer. Questions he can't answer, but questions that will contribute to his enlightenment of God's overall plan. 
God even wants Job to prepare for their conversation, to be ready for it. He says, brace yourself like a man. In other words, Job, you'd better be ready for some confrontation. I'm going to do the questioning, says God, and you will do the answering. Job is not given the opportunity to speak before God begins the first series of questions. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. Who determined its measure, if you know? Or who stretched the line on it? Whereupon were its foundations fastened? Who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? God is laying out his grand architectural work, the creation of the earth. Of course, Job was not a party to any of the decisions that went into the earth's measurements. Not even Adam and Eve were present to witness any of those early decisions. Job had no part in stretching a line upon the surface of the earth to ensure that the foundations would run true. He didn't see the foundations being sunk into the ground or the cornerstone being laid. The whole process of creation is a mystery to Job. All he knows at that time was revealed only in the scriptures. Now we've only read the first 11 verses of chapter 38, but I can tell you that God's response to Job's request goes on for four more chapters. And it spans the entire created universe step by step. We hear the birth of the seas, the movement of the constellations, the patterns of the winds and the rains, the habits of the wild creatures, a continual stream of questions, questions that are unanswerable because they're a mystery to Job and they're a mystery to us. But with each question, we become more and more aware of how deep and fathomless are the mysteries of God, which we all try desperately to understand. After all, our minds only allow us to think small. Humans think in terms of the courtroom. God thinks in terms of the cosmos. Human theories cannot possibly capture the complexity of the universe nor can they contain the chaos. We want, no, we actually demand to have answers to everything, don't we? I'm reminded of the early days of raising our children when it would seem that they never stopped with the questions. And the one that always threw me was, why? Why? And when I ran out of answers, there's only one thing left to say, because. There are just some things I couldn't answer. So I always consider that a non-answer. And that seems to be what Job is experiencing, a non-answer to his question. Instead, what he gets from God is a rebuttal. God never explains why Job has suffered as he has. Barbara Brown Taylor wrote a book titled Home by Another Way, and in it she observes that Job's question was really about justice. God's answer was about omnipotence. And she says this, she says, as far as I know, that is the only answer human beings have ever gotten about why things happen the way they do. God only knows, and none of us is God. The reference to God as Yahweh in the book of Job should remind us that our God is sovereign. He's sovereign over the entire universe. The God who magnificently created the world is the same God who enters into covenant 
and in whom we can trust. God never declares Job innocent or guilty. He changes the subject and he begins to talk about the wonders of the world, his creation. He formed the earth. He set the structure. He put bounds to keep the sea under control. He created all the heavenly bodies and he's able to control even the weather. And all the while, he continues to throw the questions at Job. He keeps reminding him and us that mere humans could never accomplish all of this. So what should we take away from this brief part of Job's dilemma? After all, Job remains in the dark about why he or any other human, for that matter, should suffer there have been and there will always be those times when we are going to form questions for God. And when the answer comes, it doesn't deal directly with the question that was raised. Perhaps the questions were unanswerable, like that response to my kids, because... The most common understanding of God's response is exactly this point. Job and his friends have been trying to answer a question that they can never solve. There are mysteries far beyond human comprehension, such as how to make a world, how to explain suffering. Job is advised to recognize human limits and trust that God will take care of what Job and others cannot know and cannot do. That gives us exactly what the lessons are that we need to learn from this scripture today. They're plain, they're simple, but they're profound. Number one, believe. Believe with all your heart in the absolute sovereignty of God and pray that God will give you that conviction in your heart. Number two, believe with all your heart that everything he does is right and good and pray that God will give you the assurance to know it. Number three, repent of all the times that you have questioned God or found fault with him in the way he has treated you. Pray that God would humble you to see these murmurings that you do as just plain sinful. And lastly, be satisfied with the holy will of God in your life. In other words, accept the fact that when we don't understand why or how, just accept that God only knows, and none of us, none of us is God. Amen and amen. Friends, I invite you now to stand and affirm your belief as we say together the Nicene Creed, which is printed on the back of your bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory 
to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And we believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our closing hymn today is number 143, This Is My Father's World. Friends, remember that God only knows, and none of us is God. So as you leave today, remember that you go nowhere by accident. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. God has a purpose for you being there. Christ lives in you, and he has something he wants to do through you, right where you are. Believe this. And go in the grace and the love and the power of Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the outstanding fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. <laughs>